Hi, my name is Carol Ricard, and thank you so much for joining me on this episode. Um, now, if this is your first time tuning in, I just want to share the mission of this show is to inspire, inform, and empower. Um, I am a stage three cancer survivor, and I had a huge advantage going through my cancer journey. Because you see, for 30 years, I've actually taught stress management in hospitals. And so I had a lot of tools to use and to help me manage, you know, along in my journey. Now, this show today is going to be more about what we need to be doing, especially as cancer patients, to really take back control of stress. And in our last show, I wanted to kind of, we, we kind of did, oh, oh, well, listen, this is part three, okay? I hated to say part three because I don't want people to feel like they missed something. If you didn't see the other shows, go back and watch them, but you're going to be able to get something out of your time today because I'm going to do a quick recap, all right? And so... First, we talked about what stress is. And stress is simply our brain's response to a change or a situation. It is hardwired. We cannot stop our brain from doing this. But I've learned that using these tools and the strategies we're going to talk about, you can learn to have freedom. Like stress doesn't have to control you, that you can actually be able to sort of control it. And that change or situation could be positive or negative, and it could be big or small. All right. What's really important about cancer patients is that research has shown it's even more important for those of us to really take steps to manage the stress because it shows three things. One is that cancer has been connected to speeding, the, I mean, stress has been connected to speeding the growth of cancer, all right? The second is it's been shown to impact on treatment outcomes. And lastly, which was really the kind of the most recent research about a year ago, was for survivors, it was actually connected to a reoccurrence of cancer. And so especially for cancer people, we have to be doing something to actively manage it. All right. And unfortunately, this is a part that isn't covered in a lot of treatment programs. And honestly, what you learn is really not going to work. Um, you see, 20 years ago, I was desperate. I ended up in my doctor's office three weeks in a row with migraines. And the problem was I wasn't managing my stress very good at work. So I accidentally, desperately, discovered this therapy that I'm going to share with you next. And I'm going to come back to the board. I call it rapid relief therapy, right? Because here's my thinking. We have to be able to do something about stress anytime, anywhere we are. And the problem with stress management, I was doing that. But my migraines came at two o'clock in the afternoon. And so stress management isn't enough. We need to be doing something. We need interventions. And what I discovered is there's this two-step process that we have to take. The step one is to stop. And I'm going to bring back my bottle root beer because I use, this is one of the ways I get people to think about stress. Life kind of happens and the pressure builds up inside and the two steps we have to do are we have to stop that level from rising in us and then we also though have to release it because here's the thing people can only hold so much and then it goes one of two directions all right well it's kind of like a soda bottle it either explodes and people do that the stress comes out on people or it implodes and if you don't think it happens to bottles i want to show you a bottle 
kind of, I don't know, you could probably see how this bottle is sort of all dented up. That was one of my old bottles. And I discovered that after four months of leaving it in the garage. And I was like, wow, it happens to bottles too. And the other analogy I like to get people to think about is a tub, right? What would happen if you turned your tub on at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then you didn't come home to turn it off until 530 at night? A mess, right? Well, that's what stress management was for me. It still left me with a mess. And the mess was my migraines. And so it was out of that desperation that I discovered these two steps. Now, what's really important about these two steps is one has to be calming and the other has to be active. And we're going to talk just briefly about the first step, but mostly today we're going to focus on the second step. But before we can do something about our stress, you got to know how high is it. And so I like to call that being a stress detective. And the quickest way to do it is on a scale of one to 10. I used to do this with my migraines, check in with myself at 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, one to 10. Where am I now? One is low, 10 is high. But here's the thing. If we're at a five or higher, we have to take action. We have to do something and we have to use what I'm talking about here in these shows. And if you miss the other episodes, you can catch them on the archives here at, um, you know, the TV station, or you can catch them at I am not cancer dot live. And I always put the, the replays up there as well. But to become a stress detective, there's one other thing we got to do. We got to start paying attention to ourselves. And because our brain gives us signals, the brain is this magnificent like machinery that just really gives us signals. They're subtle though, right? And we have to start paying attention to them. And I'm sure, you know, you can recognize some of these. And so that's what else we talked about in the last show. And I just kind of want to give an example, right? There are three ways our brain gives us signals. There's the physical symptoms that show up in our body. There's the emotional kind of signals that kind of show up. What are we feeling? And then lastly, which you can't see, it says behavioral. And that's really what are we doing? You know, what do we find ourselves doing? Um, and I had shared the last show, I found myself, you know, kind of eating a lot of chocolate when I started to get stressed out. All right. And I have a great handout for you at, again, I am not cancer dot live, but it's a great handout it comes from my latest book. I am not cancer. And it kind of highlights those things. But more importantly, what I love is that there's an inventory here. All right. And there are about 20 or 30. I just gave enough here to kind of give you the idea. All right. And then lastly, what we talked about in our last show was what do we do to calm? And the stop has to be something calming. And I kind of went through some examples, but more importantly, on our last show, I had you experience for yourselves because, again, we always want three tools that we can always have access to. And I talked about our breath, right? I talked about self talk. And then I also kind of talked about what I use is the serenity prayer, but using a verse, a mantra, it could be a poem, a poem verse, a music verse. But those are three things that I can use and nobody needs to know I'm using them. Make sense? Which then brings us to today's show, because once we stop the level from rising, we actually have to take action to release it. And so that's what I'm going to spend the rest of our time together is having you experience some of that, right? And kind of what that is. So let me come back to my board. So 
So the release means something active. You have to use muscles. You have to use energy because really that's what our stress response is giving us. It's kind of like generating this massive amount of energy. And the problem is, is it if you don't release it, you are either going to explode or implode as sort of the body's natural release. And that's what we want to really try to avoid. All right. So what are some ways that we can do that? Well, I got to tell you, again, we want to always have three that we can use. And the three that we always have, and let me get these written up here. All right, so we can always walk. So truthfully, I could be walking right now. I could be sitting in a meeting and basically I'm just picking up my feet and moving them. So I want you to do that right now. If you're sitting down, go ahead. You could stand up if you can, do it sitting down, but simply just kind of walk in place. Now, if you're somewhere, you know, where you can walk, get up and actually go walk to the bathroom, all right? Because here's the other thing, and I forgot to kind of kind of say this, is those two steps we want to do, even our goal is to do them for 60 seconds each step. So to calm, right, to stop for 60 and to release for 60. But the trick is, even if you just do 15 seconds, 15 seconds is better than nothing at all. Again, come back to this bottle and think of this. Just a quick little release is going to begin to let some of that pressure out. Make sense? The other one that we can always do is talk. And honestly, I've had lots of conversations with bosses or coworkers that I was really stressed out by and I was pissed off at, right? And I didn't do it, though, when they were there. Um, in my treatment programs at the hospital, we would kind of call this the empty chair, right? You put the person in the chair and then you just let it out um, and let it fly. Because, again, by opening and releasing our mouth, we're releasing some of that pressure to bring it down. And then the last thing that we actually have is the right or what I call dump. So here's the thing. I learned this 30 years ago working in a women's trauma program um, from a doctor, and I've kind of adapted it to my own use with stress. She was talking about, you know, traumatic kind of nightmares <clears throat> and things at night that would keep people up at night. And, and here's what a brain dump is. I call it a brain dump or a dump and destroy. Whatever really kind of works best for you that's what you use. That's what you call it. But the point being is it's very different than journaling. You see, journaling is when we write and then we read it and we want to reflect on it and we want to hold it. A brain dump is just the opposite. We want to get it out and we want to just leave it out. So what it is, is that you take a piece of paper and it could be just even a little scrap paper. Now, what I love to do is I love to take paper that I kind of, I don't want to throw it away. So I sort of reuse it. And I just save this. I take papers in half. And then you just start writing. And I would have my patient say, Carol told me to start writing. All right. Um, listen, this is a 30-minute show. So I really don't have the time to do that right now. But it's great. It's a great exercise that if, even if you do it when we're done, I want you to just take a piece of paper today and just start writing. Say, Carol told me to just dump whatever it is that's in my brain or what I'm feeling on this paper. Now, you know what? One of the things I discovered accidentally, and again, I just take regular pieces of paper that are scrap. I'm going to throw them in the garbage. I fold them in half and then I reuse them. And what I always put at the top of my paper is, I call it the dump slip. I just write that at the top, dump slip. And what I discovered in the last two weeks is that I rewrite now over them. And, and so here's the amazing thing. I will just take this, right? And I will write one. And then 
what I do is I turn it upside down and I start writing over the same line. This is really good for people that cannot not read. All right. But the point being is get it on the paper and then you know what you can do? You take the paper, either you can rip it up once you've written what it is into little shreds, or if you have a paper shredder, you can do that. Or one last thing I used to do with my patients, we actually made dump boxes. Simply went to, bought some little wooden box banks, right? Little wooden boxes. And this is something that I did during my cancer journey every single day. But I noticed like two, three weeks ago, I wasn't doing the writing. And guess what was happening? It was coming out as anxiety at work. And so every morning, I make sure that I just take a minute or two and just start dumping. Now, it could be writing positive things, right? Like after the Memorial Day weekend, I just was like, I am so grateful because I've never had a three-day weekend. And it just was so wonderful and relaxing. And so it could be even good things we write down. But the trick is get in the habit of doing it daily. What I would do, though, is put these little pieces of paper in my dump box. All right. And then what I would end up doing is actually... Once the box got full, then I would take them and put them all through the shredder. All right. So if that's one way that you can do that. Now, the reason I came up with that is because here's the thing. If we're stressed out about a particular thing, those thoughts are probably going to come back up again. And what happens is when those thoughts or those feelings pop back up, right, and they're like, oh, um, we picture them being in the box. And so the picture of the box or the picture, the image of the shredder in our mind overrides the thought, all right? That pictures have more power, images have more power in our brain than a thought, all right? So that's one way, but here's the other way. Maybe you don't know what it is you're feeling. And I had a girlfriend who was really struggling. She'd lost her mom. And about eight months afterwards, you know, I, I kind of noticed she was struggling. And I kind of said, you know, what's going on? She's like, oh, I don't know. I just am so sad. And so what I said to her was, is because she's a thinker, right? And I knew that she really wasn't connected to her heart, right? Because here's the thing. Some of us are better at the thought and thinking, and some of us are kind of better at recognizing our feelings and our emotions. She was more a thinker and an analyzer than she was a feeler. But I knew she had feelings in there that were just building up on her, right? So what I did was I actually bought her set of markers. Now, I just happened to grab my um, pencils, right? could be colored pencils that you use, or it could be, quite honestly, a crayon, because it says ages X and up. It doesn't say once you get to be 30 or 40 or 50, you can't use these. But she gave me these examples to share with you. And all I did was tell her, say, pick a color and scribble. So this was one of the first ones she gave me. All right. Then... She kind of gave me a couple, and I want to share them with you as she go as we go along. Um, then she went to this one, all right? And you notice there isn't quite as much red, but there's a lot more kind of black. Um, and then she ended up going to this one, and you could see kind of now a little bit different colors. And even then, I encouraged her long after she was kind of through processing the grief and the sadness, I always encourage her to still. And so these are a couple others that she sent me. Um, and you can just see that, you know what? And think about this. When we were kids, what would we do if we were sitting in a class and we were stressed or we were, you know, kind of bored or something like that? Well, we would just take a pen and a paper and just sort of doodle. And honestly, if you're sitting in a staff meeting, that's what you can do too, is just kind of take your paper like you're writing notes and just sort of kind of like doodle. I know you don't want to do it on the table, but just another way. Now, 
I want to share this all with you because it's a true story. Maybe you're afraid that you live some people that want to look at what it is you're writing, right? Like they would go to the garbage. True story. I had a patient who was in transitional housing. And the problem with transitional is, is that he'd been homeless. This was his step out of the homeless shelter and then on to getting an apartment. But he'd never lived with anybody. All right. And living with people can be really stressful. And so what would happen to him is as he got home from our program at, you know, three, four o'clock, then he was around all these people and his stress levels would start to rise. And what would end up happening was, is he would end up saying things. He would be kind of yelling or be angry and it would come out on people. And he was about to lose his housing. And I said, John, I told you, Go put it down on the paper. Don't put it out your mouth. Just write it. Release it on the paper. He said, Carol, I can't do that. And I said, why not? And she said, because. I said, because why? He says, I'm afraid they're going to try and read it. And I thought, hmm, guess what? He has a good point. So I quickly reached back, grabbed my Sharpie, and I said, John, I want you to go to the bathroom. I want you to take some toilet paper and... I want you to dump your anger on the toilet paper. And then once it's dumped, I want you to flush it. So I came back in the next day and I said, well, how did it go? He said, Carol, I didn't lose it last night. I did exactly what you said. I went into the bathroom, just dumped my anger on the toilet paper and I flushed it. Now, remember what I told you about the visual? I mean, that's a great visual, right? <laughs> So if, if you're in a marriage or relationship, you know, and you're mad at your spouse, this is a great way of just sort of dumping this so that it's like, whoop. so you got the visual. But the other thing is you can use the audio to really superpower it because you see it going down. And to me, that's the thing about the shredder. You also hear it. And the more senses that we have, the more power it gives to us rather than the thought, if that makes sense. All right. So those are the three that we always have with us, you know, in some sort of way. Now, the other thing that we always have with us, and I'm going to share with you, is I'm, I'm a laughter yoga instructor. And so one of the things I would do when I was at the hospital and really stressed out is I would go in the bathroom and it's called the ho, ho, ha, ha. It's an exercise I created. And what it is, is I want you to do it with me right now, but I want you first to lead you through it. And then let me show you. All right. Show you first and then we'll do it. So I'm going to have you go up with your hands. Ho, ho. And then down to the floor. Extend to the floor. Ha, ha. Ho, ho. Ha, ha. Better if you're doing it standing up, but you can also do this sitting down. All right. And if you're sitting down, you can just go out to the front. Ha, ha, ho, ho, ha, ha, if you're sitting down. You're going to keep up with me. I'm going to start slow, and then I'm going to speed up. Are you ready? One, two, three. Ho, ho, ha, ha. 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 Ho, ho, ha, ho, ho, ha. And then give you a round of applause. <laughs> so what you just did there was the ho ho ha ha's get more oxygen in, right? So that could be the calming and the movement is also the release. So it's sort of a two for one. All right. The other thing I do, I'll go in the bathroom and I'll just start laughing because laughter, again, whether it's real or it's kind of intentional, like making it like I actually do. I do laughter meditation on my way to work and I'll just do this. <laughs> I started with one minute and then I just kind of built my way up. But that's something else that we always kind of have with us. All right. I also want to share a couple other tools with you and then we're going to write some things out. I always use a heavy bag. One of my five tools I use every day is my heavy bag. So the five tools I do every day, exercise, right? I actually use, do my mind push-ups, what we did in the last one. I actually will do um, my dump. I do my laughter yoga, and then I use a punching bag. Now, my thing deflated. 
I don't have a punching bag. At work, I put one in my office at the hospital. But in my new job, I don't have it. So I have an inflatable, kind of one of these. The other thing is a stress ball. What do you think a stress ball is meant for? That's the stop. I would always tell my patients to throw it against the wall because you use more energy throwing it than you do actually squeezing it. But that's another way that we can actually do that. Now, if you don't have a punching bag, I want to show you something because I used to have my patients make one. All right. Do, 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 do. Can you see that? Basically, it's a pillowcase filled with some old clothes. And then I use an extension cord to just tie it over the board, the door. And then I don't know if we'll catch it, but it's tied on the doorknob. And what I would do is have them use this as a homemade punching bag so that that way you actually have a something at home. Now, I was just looking online to see. And actually, I found this inflatable and it's about you know, it says 63 inches, which means 533. Three, three. And it's inflatable and only, I think it was $30. So those are some things. But I want to list out a few others here. So you can sing or dance, right? You can actually clean for some people. We have exercise. We also have um, any kind of hobbies. You can draw or paint, right? Even puzzles, even if you do word puzzles, right? Sudoku puzzles, you're moving your pencil. And so that's the release. The other thing is, you know, sometimes people do gardening. Um, if you can get outside and then laughter. And then lastly, our ho, ho, ha, ha. All right. So those are just some other tools that we can use because, again, you want to stop and then we want to release. Now, I actually have a postcard for everybody. When I do my workshops, I like to actually give out this little postcard. So it has the two steps. So if you go to IamNotCancer.Live, what you will find there is actually this piece of paper. You print it out, you cut it, and then what ends up happening is you just fold it. And you put this on your refrigerator so that you have it to look at. So there you have it. The final, most critical step we have to do, which is stop, but then we also have to release. So. To catch past episodes, go to IamNotCancer.Live or watch them on the archives here at the station. And you know what? It's like I'm looking at my timer and time just flies by. So like us on Facebook at I Am Not Cancer, And I want to invite you to come back and go get the handouts. And I'll see you on the next show.